why are we even thinking about adult literacy at public libraries? Because for the last two years, we've been saying two things. One, on a national level, we've been saying libraries transform. On a local level, we've been saying libraries are education. So if we mean these things, then we have to actually do them, right? And I know it's like, why should we do this when we have so much other stuff on our plates? And that's an excellent question. But according to the State Department, more than 2.7 million New Yorkers over the age of 16 do not have a high school diploma. An additional 1.2 million adults do not speak English well or at all. And 22% of New Yorkers have below basic literacy skills. So you can imagine how challenging it is to navigate day-to-day -day life for people that don't have these skills. We believe public libraries are perfectly positioned to do this work, and today we're going to hear about how some of our really incredible colleagues are creating programs to meet the needs of their communities. So we have a phenomenal panel today. We have Jennifer Ballerman um, from Patchogue Medford Library, Betsy Kennedy from Casanova Public Library, and Tara Truitt from Madison County Reads Ahead. Jennifer Ballerman is currently Head of Central Reference and Adult Services at the Patch of Medford Library on Long Island, a position she's held for the last two years. Prior to this position, she was the Adult Services Department Head at the Longwood Public Library. She believes that the public library exists to provide all members of the community with equal opportunities and to empower all citizens to reach their highest potential and achieve their goals. Providing residents with the support and instruction they need to improve their literacy skills is the axis on which her 20-year professional career has always spun. Jennifer currently serves on the Board of Public Library Section and the Intellectual Freedom of the New York Library Association. Tara Truitt is a retired educator with more than 32 years of experience. She holds a degree in administration and supervision from St. John's, a master's in special education from St. Rose, and a BA from SUNY Portland. She previously taught adult evening evening adult education classes for a decade at Madison Oneida BOCES. In retirement, Tara enjoys working as a part-time director of Madison County Reads Ahead, helping adults pursue their high school equivalency or those seeking services in adult basic education and English as a second language. She also coordinates the Dolly Parton Imagination Library in Madison County. Reading and baking take up much of her spare time. <laughs> Betsy is the director of the Oh, she is still there. I thought she was going to the back. I was like, where did Betsy go? <laughs> this is the director of the Casadovia Public Library. Her involvement in several local organizations, including the Chamber of Commerce, the Rotary, Casanova Arts and Heritage Alliance, and Madison County Tourism has resulted in a number of successful collaborations, including what you'll hear about today. And a fun fact about Betsy, she is a former volunteer firefighter and medic. <laughs> Last year, her library was selected Library of the Year for Central New York, and she was honored to be selected as the Public Library Staff All-Star by Central Library Resources Council. So please join me in welcoming Betsy, Tara, and Jennifer. And, and I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer to get us started. And I'm going to turn off my phone. Oh, yes. Please do that if you have not already. Turn it Sorry about that difficult to pronounce sentence. My staff was telling me I was my original was a little too boring. <laughs> so I may have overreached. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I'm currently at the Patch of Metro Library, and the literacy model that we have there is on you know the handouts and you'll see it later. But I'm going to talk today about a project I did at my previous library where um, we actually trained the library staff to become literacy tutors. Um, I wholeheartedly believe that literacy is the most important thing we do. So for me, everything else is secondary. So it's very easy for me to make decisions by putting literacy first, because I think that's, that is by far the most important thing that we do. I also want to say before we get too deep that one size does not fit all. I've worked at different libraries, and we've all had different models of trying to address um, the community's literacy needs. So to just keep that in mind, that there are many, many different ways to try to um, serve the community in this way. Okay. Okay. So Longwood Public Library, big suburban library on Long Island, serves 65,000, staff of 100, 50% at that time were non-native speakers. 
Don't laugh at the number of staff, please. I know, I know. Um, <laughs> but uh, so when we got there, they weren't doing any literacy services. I mean, you can see 15% are non-native speakers. So you know right there, you probably need some ESL going on. So um, we started to the ball rolling on doing some literacy services. And we started by hiring some ESL teachers to do big classes. And that went pretty well, and that went on for about a year or so. But we were troubled because we still had a lot of people in the community coming in and asking us to read their social security statements to them. These were native, these were native English speakers for the most part, and they kind of they kind of fall through the cracks. Um, and we were getting upset by this, but this was a regular occurrence. Can you read my mail to me? Could you help me write a letter? Because my handwriting's terrible. You know, that was very, very common. And we also had a large number of patrons who were coming to us because they failed the GED, or later the task. Uh, they just couldn't do the essay part. So they would come in and be like, could somebody here sit down and help me? Okay. So this was regular occurrence for us. And also people who are um, finishing up with ESL, they then needed, if they were going to go to college or someplace else, they might also then need somebody to help them with their writing. So we met as a department to discuss this because it was it was common enough that we were all seeing it and all dealing with it. And we were like, well, what could what could we do about this? And we decided that, yeah, this has got to be a priority. This is going to be a big priority for us. Um, and that we probably should focus on increasing the number of tutors available to help address this. And then I asked for volunteers. And I was told by just about everyone that I am not qualified and there is no time. And I said, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. We already decided this was a priority. <laughs> so now we're just going to figure out how best we can do this. So I listened to all of them and I tried to learn what their hangups were about it. Um, and the core issue was fear. They were just afraid to do it. Time actually was secondary. Um, they said that up front because it's easier, but it really the big concern was just this fear. So I decided, all right, well, we need to do extensive training. That'll help alleviate the fear. Um, and I delved a little further, and I learned that the parts they were most afraid of were meeting the student for the first time um, and just getting stuck and not knowing where to go. And I said, OK, all right, I can help with that. We'll figure that part out. Um, and I promised them it would only be one hour of their week, which in the beginning, that was it ended up being a little more, but I did get it down to one hour a week. Okay. Um, Eleanor is like by far my favorite mm. historical figure. And it is not fair to ask of others what you are not willing to do yourself. And I wholeheartedly believe this is a very good <laughs> approach to take as a manager because you know, you're know going to model the way. So it's, the fear will be less if they see you doing what exactly you're asking them to do. So I knew from the get-go that the most of the work in setting this up, it was going to be me as the coordinator. It was going to be me doing most of the work in the beginning. And I was going to show them this is not so scary. And in reality, though, I was scared too. I mean, what do I know? At that point, I was just a librarian. I never did any tutoring, really. But I'm like, OK, I, we can do this. I'm like, I want to do it. There's no other option. So I said, all right. So I'm going to talk to experts, read, learn as much as I can um, about this. We weren't alone, and libraries sometimes were a little more insular, gotten better over the years, but I had no trouble getting money from Rotary in our area. There were so many retired teachers that we just reached out to them. They were like, hey, we're trying to do this. So I had a bunch of volunteers just from names I'd kept over the years, teachers coming in. If you ever have any, you know, any opportunities, we'd love to help volunteer. And the politicians in the area also were on board, and we did get some money from them as well. Honestly, if you put up a sign, too, in your library, I got a, I just put up a sign, like, in a week, I got another volunteer. I mean, just to give you an idea. People, the community wants to help other members of the community. So the training plan, I built a, a little adult learner collection with funds I got from Rotary. Um, we selected a book system to use. Um, for the trainings, and I hired a literacy professional to do like two-day training for all the librarians. 
And at that point, I just asked in my library, who wants to do this? And it was, I asked everybody, librarians, clerks, pages. And we got like 10 that were like, yes, we're going to do it. And I said, all right, 10 is great. We'll start with 10. And we did the trainings. Um, and it went, you know, reasonably, reasonably well. Um, we knew we needed this, like a focus, because we did, we're not going to have infinite resources. I did not have tons of tutors. So we decided that the goal of the program was to promote and maintain basic literacy, skill, literacy skills of English-speaking adults. Okay. Um, we would assist with spelling, vocabulary, writing, and reading comprehension. Okay. And later on, when you start doing this, you'll start to add to your um, description of your program and your guidelines, because you're going to learn as you go along. And then later, we had to add this program is for students who want to improve their ability to read and write basic English. Um, and that was because we started getting a lot of college students who needed help analyzing. <laughs> Even you don't notice when you start, you're like, all right. So like that, so I said, do not include the ability to read Shakespeare biology textbooks or other no material. Like, all right, you gotta, you know, gotta, gotta draw the line, exactly. And the guidelines we started with, you had to be an adult, 18 years and older, um, and out of high school. Um, because there were, you know, if you were still technically in high school, you should be getting those services there. Um, okay, uh, of course this is pretty self-explanatory. Um, bullet point number four, again, that was added later, things you cannot predict. Uh, people will come looking for literacy tutors because the court sent them, <laughs> and they don't necessarily make the best students because they don't want to be there, and then the court starts calling you and asking you for letters and stuff, so we just said, okay, yeah. We didn't sign on for that, so we just, the, I borrowed this from some library, and I, I don't know which one, I can't remember, but this program cannot effectively serve people who are mandated to enroll by a third party. Again, that came later. Guidelines were consistently revised over the year, over the year based on what was happening. Like, could we have predicted that? No. And then obviously a cancellation statement, because some people have the best of intentions, but end up not showing, so. Application process, filled out the application. One person reviewed and made follow-up phone calls. This had to be me. I knew that from the beginning. That was part of the alleviating the fear of the staff is that I was going to vet everybody, make time of check on their times, find out if they're a serious student, check what their goals are, and then assign a tutor. Um, and then once I've assigned the tutor, I would go to the first meeting with them kind of uh, figure out where they should start with the student, do a little little test. Um, at this point, we were using a book called uh, Lit Start, which I don't recommend. So you, can write it, you can write it down if you want, but I wouldn't use that book again. But that's what we started with that on the recommendation of a literacy professional. And they had a little test in that. So I would go in, figure out where they're going to start, and then the tutor knew that I was available if they got stuck. And at first, if I didn't know, I would just call a literacy professional and ask on behalf. Um, we also, we, we didn't have trouble getting students. Like I said, we had enough traffic coming through the desk and asking for it. That was the big impetus to start the service to begin with. But we put up a sign in the library and we sent uh, flyers to all like the local social service agencies. And we just, we kept getting students. Some stayed, some went, but we, we did not have trouble getting students. They'll find you. People asked me about the time investment. After the initial setup, um, and like see, me being willing to take the brunt of the work as the coordinator and willing to learn about it, um, it was a it was a it was a, a bit in the beginning, but then it, it's nothing. Then it's you know taking an application, making a phone call, going to the first meeting. And for, uh, as far as for your tutors, you can't get it down to one hour a week. They get one student, they meet one hour a week. Um, and you can keep it less in prep time and such by picking like a method that you all use. You buy books, they come in a series. And it really helps keep down the prep time. Before we switched to doing it that way, it was more like an hour and a half to two hours investment time for the staff. 
Um, but once we started working with method books in series, like you can get most of them from pro-literacy, um, it, it really cut down. And you didn't have to worry like, okay, we're going to just work through this book. So it's the time we've got, you know, we've got our reader, we've got our, you know, speller, and it makes it a lot, lot easier. Um, there's also many different tools online where you're generating and stuff like that that you start to learn about. I will say, uh, for us, most of the students we got, not most, but at least a, at least a third to a half, were dyslexic, whether they knew it or not, or something along those lines. Um, so just something to be prepared for. Um, that didn't freak me out. It freaked out some of the librarians in the beginning, but we learned about it, and we just you teach a method to everybody that you know works for dyslexia. It's like a basic, um, like a strong phonics system that works for pretty much anybody. So uh, once we started seeing what we were getting, we started to switch. You know, something like the Wilson method or any of those, um, which helped a lot. People say, well, we're not qualified to help dyslexics. Well, they don't have anything else to go to, so you might as well try. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them were, were college dropouts because a lot of dyslexics will kind of cope until and then they get to college and they can't do it. Okay. It's all scalable. You know, I think for you just decide what's a realistic place to start. You can do small groups, um, but really just don't let your fear stop you because it's just too meaningful. Um, all of us are caring human beings. Um, are you qualified? Yeah. Well, you certainly are. Can you do this? And most of you, I'm sure, could say just yeah. Your patrons are so grateful. It's the most fulfilling thing you probably will ever do. Um, I had one of my students tell me I was her gift from God because she wanted to take civil service exams. I've had other ones write me and tell me I can read to my grandchild now or I can chat with my daughters overseas. So. It's not nearly as scary as you think once you kind of get into it. I hope that was just 15 minutes. Do we have questions? Well, we'll do questions at the end. Yep. Now we'll have territory. All right, I'm just trying to make sure. Oh, I just hit the little arrow up here. Yeah. Well. Okay, gotcha. Okay, I don't know where I'm going first. Hi. <laughs> Very true. And um, I've been with Madison County Reads Ahead program for. I think I'm going on five years. I'm not exactly sure, but um, you know, it doesn't matter because it doesn't feel like a job. I love it. <laughs> I actually saw the, an, uh, request on Facebook, and I knew the person who would put the request on there, and I had been retired, and I would taken a year off, and you know, the gardening and everything was fun, but I'm like, mm -hmm. i got to do something. <laughs> <laughs> I help people. <laughs> I can't just sit here. So. Uh, you know, I started out that way and I've uh, been going ever since and I really do love it. Uh, this is kind of starting at the end, but this is just a picture of um, some of our graduates. We have a graduation ceremony in May, so that's coming up for us. Not everybody that attends the program comes to graduation, but, um, you know, we send out the invitation and call because uh, the people who do the tutoring and what we have coordinators, which I'll get into, and they stay in contact with people. And we let everybody know that there is a graduation ceremony. We collected the, um, <coughs> excuse me, the graduation caps and gowns from different places who had them. And we have a closet full of them at one of our libraries. And they're thrilled to put those mm -hmm. on. They just are thrilled. They're thrilled with the whole, the whole event. So it's wonderful. And the gentleman on your right, let's see, I've got to do this always. Okay, the gentleman on your right um, is uh, John Salta, and he is a um, town supervisor in one of our towns in Madison County. He himself earned his GED. He said he wasn't the best student in high school, so he had gotten his GED. So he loves to come every year and tell his story because he's a town supervisor. He just retired as the head um, of the respiratory 
uh, part of Hamilton Hospital. Uh, so he's a success story and he loves to share that with people. So this is what it looks like at the end. And how we got there, the way our program is set up, it's very similar to what Jennifer was saying, except I did. I think I noticed that we did not, from the very beginning, <coughs> excuse me, ask staff, library staff, to do this. Um, the program started through a grant, and it started at one of the libraries, and there's 12 in Madison County. It started at one of the libraries because what the director at that time, the librarian director, I should say, at that time, knew that this was what was needed. Uh, people were coming in, very similar to what Jennifer said, needing help with reading, needing help with, you know, paperwork and, and reading letters and things, and decided to start this program. It was, so it was started very small. It was started on a grant. And um, then local coordinators over the years, I can tell you more about what it is. I don't want to keep going back through the whole history because we can do that when, if, you know, parts that you're interested in. But the way the program is set up right now is, you know, I have the big fancy title of program director. It means I do the paperwork. We all know how that goes. The local coordinators are wonderful. There's a local coordinator at almost every library in Madison County. And um, they are mostly paid for through friends of the library or through the library and gets them in their budget over the years, okay? And they're not paid big bucks. They're paid a stipend. They get between 15 and... 1600 a year, so it's gas money. <laughs> Everybody that works with this program does it because they love it, and, um, and they're just in passionate about um, helping people and being that resource for people. So local coordinators are at each library, and um, <clears throat> there's, say, Casanova, where Betsy's from, there's just two coordinators there. Some of the libraries, like in Hamilton, in the village of Hamilton, which is where Colgate University is. I know I, I throw out these towns, and it's like you probably have no idea what I'm talking about, so I want to give you a little reference point. But there is a, a, there was a coordinator there. She moved to California. So now I'm the coordinator there, which is fine with me. I don't mind. Um, and we don't have what Morrisville, so we kind of do Morrisville and Hamilton together. It's a very loose system, okay? But it does work. All right, so these are our coordinators, and then you see the heart, and the heart of our program is all of our tutors are volunteers. And there are volunteers from the community, pretty much as Jennifer said, you know, they're retired teachers. Not all of them are teachers. You don't have to be a teacher to do this, and that's one of the things we let. A lot of people are just, they're kind of afraid. Oh, I don't think I know that. I don't, I don't know that good math. I don't know all that stuff they're doing nowadays, and um, they don't feel they can do it. And pretty much what I tell people is, if you have a willingness to do it and a desire to do it, that's 95% of what you need. Everything else will come with you. There are books, there are series of things, and we, the coordinator, helps them lay all of that out. So, you know, you're not there, oh, here's your student, I'm gonna match you up with Betsy, you go teach Betsy everything, and we'll see you when she graduates. Um, you know, there's a whole program there. The resources are there. The resources, all of our program are run by grants. Um, the, besides grants, I would say the other part are the friends of the library with the coordinators, but everything else is done through grants. I just wrote two grants last week. They're small grants, too. I mean, we really run on a shoestring. Uh, I, my position is paid for through the Central New York Community Foundation. And uh, I don't know, what do I make? I think I make, like, $14,000 a year or something like that, you know, um, and, and that's how, how I am paid. In the past, the, you know, the, the program director was paid accordingly and has been, but, the, you know, now that we're encompassing 12 libraries instead of one library, things have grown a little, but um, that's where that money comes from. Um, and let's see, let's go on. I don't want to talk too much. I'll take Betsy's time. Okay, the way we get volunteers, and pretty much what Jennifer said, is we just put signs up. We ask uh, retired teachers, you know, you'll go to your local school and say, who's the person who's in charge of your retired teachers? And they'll put the word out. Um, we also put news releases in local newspapers. Um, word of mouth is one of the best ways to do it. I put, I've sent out flyers and asked people to 
post a little thing in all the church bulletins. We're looking for volunteers in your community. We're only asking. We ask for two hours a week. Um, and, the, you know, the, it's not a lot of prep time either. Once people kind of get into it, and we show them the resources. Um, and RSVP. I don't know if you have RSVP around here, but uh, that's another source that we have for volunteers. So, it, and right now we have in the counting, I think we have 56 volunteer, active volunteers right now. It's been anywhere from about 50, mid 50s to up in about 80. Um, and some people are worried that they're going to be a volunteer, but then they go on a vacation or something, you know, they might go away. We work with everybody, you know. We might give a volunteer if we know somebody who is only around a few months out of the year because they fly south or whatever, they're one of those snowbirds, we might give them with some, somebody that we know once we test them out and they're not going to need a program for like a whole year or two years. They're going to go a little quicker. So we try to make a good match with the, um, with the tutor and, and the learner. Okay. Uh, okay, I think I already went over that. The tutor training process. Well, it's evolved over the years. When I first got into this, um, there was a guy running the program named Morris. Morris is a wonderful, wonderful gentleman. And um, he would hold training sessions for the tutors. And I went to the first one. And he did a lovely job. He did a lovely job. It was four nights, though, four consecutive nights a week. I had gotten some of my retired teacher friends to come to it. And they'd go out in the hall and look at me. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm really, really sorry. Because <laughs> there are different levels of, you know, of what training people need. And so that evolved. I went quickly from four nights down to two nights, down to one night. Now guess what I do? I train all the tutors one-on-one. -on -one. I have a notebook, a three-ring binder. I have all my pages in there. I meet the person at the library of their choice. I sit there with them for maybe an hour, hour and a half. We go over everything. You know, I'm all about fast tracking anything you can fast track. So, and it seems to work really well um, that way. So, if anybody here would like me to share my little training book, you can let me know. I'm not very technologically minded, but somehow I will figure out how to scan it and send it and disseminate it. But uh, there's not really that many pages in it. But, um, Elisha, yes, the IT girl, my my sweetheart in Casanova Library. Anytime I can't do anything, I call Elisha. <laughs> and she likes my big goods, so I it's a mutual respect. <laughs> okay, volunteer appreciation every year. It is so important, and I think this is the week or next week that is volunteer appreciation week. Well, we try to appreciate our volunteers all year long. The coordinators very much appreciate their volunteers and work very closely with their local vol with their volunteers because they're at that library, um, uh, you know, for a few hours a week, and so they see them interact with them all the time. They're the the local coordinators, the go-to person for the tutor. So we do a number of things. Um, we usually give holiday gifts, and I have a sister who's very crafty, and I like to bake. So between the two of us. We make up little goodie bags, nice. and um, in the last couple of years, we've just uh, I've made a few up for however many tutors are already each library. Put a little homemade card in there, some homemade biscotti, some candy, and a little waxed ornament that my sister makes. You know, whatever you have friends, you know who you call on. <laughs> okay, there's just little. They, they just need to know they're out there because sometimes it can seem very isolating. They're working one on one with somebody. Yes, they have the coordinator. Uh, we have tutors. When this session that you see this picture of, we just had, is this the one? Let me see. Yeah, I have the right? That's not the right one yet. Nope. Okay. That's a different training session. I might be coming up to the other picture I put on there because we just had one, I think, last week on the 12th of April. I don't know what day it is. Um, anyway, um, <clears throat> you know, we do an annual training every year combined with a luncheon. So we usually run from 10 to 2. Everybody comes, and we usually go to Casanova Library because that's just a great place to hold an event. And um, we'll get, I'll get speakers in. If I get speakers in, I usually give them a hundred dollar stipend out of the budget, and um, we have it on different resources. Sometimes I'll send out one of those 
doodle polls, I think you call it, mm -hmm. and find out, send out a bunch of topics, have people come back to me, what would you most like to hear about? I'll give them some topics. Uh, sometimes it's on the argu argumentative writing essay that goes with the task, because that seems people like a lot of ideas for that. It might be on, you know, how do you engage your learners? It could be a variety of topics. So we get that down. And so we do one or two training sessions, and then we do a, a catered luncheon. And everybody loves coming together. It's, it's just a fun time. And we usually, I usually hold that in April. Um, sometimes the local coordinators will be the ones to put on that session. If they have expertise in certain areas, so they might be the one doing that. And I, we give them a stipend, too, because it's a little extra work. Uh, we put recognition in local newspapers, like this might be a photo that we put in the local newspaper showing that this was the appreciation, you know, and this is the tutoring program going on, so it's some PR, and it's just uh, showing the pe that uh, people in their community are caring for other people in their community. And you have to be responsible, responsive to the needs of the tutors and to check in. I, the tutoring session that we just did in April, there's one tutor who has been in the Ida Library now for 17 years. She's been tutoring. And she said to the newest coordinator who's there, because Christy's only been there a couple of years, she said to Christy a couple of times, she goes, you know, we used to get together, just the um, tutors in Oneida, and we used to have like a little party. And she keeps saying this to Christy, so I told Gwen. I, she mentioned it to me, and I said, Gwen, in May or in June, we will get to, It's just important to her. It's something they used to do years ago. She always looked forward to it. I can make that happen. And it just, you know, you got to listen to the people that are out there helping you. 17 years is quite a long time to be volunteering. So somebody calls up in the morning, and my own personal cell phone, this is how small we are, my personal cell phone is a number that's plastered all over the county. If you want to get your high school equivalency, you call my cell phone. I shut it off while we're here, okay? <laughs> we don't have a phone. <laughs> so the whole county 70,000 people. Yeah. So I get a lot of strange phones. I got a text at I got a text at 3:04 last night. The only reason my phone was on was because my alarm was on so that I could get up and get here in the morning. But now that I'm retired, I don't go to work till 10. So this was this is a big deal here that I'm awake. But anyway, um, you know, people call. Yeah, the 3:04 text because I heard the thing go off and I thought I'm not getting up. But um, it was one of my students because I personally tutor as well just because it's fun. Um, and he called to tell me that he probably wasn't going to make the test today because he was running to the bathroom all night long, and there's a test test today, and I'm like, a little more information than I need to be. Okay. <laughs> all right. Anyway, um, so say this guy who was, uh, who was on the phone uh, texting me. Originally, he had called up. It's Chris. I had him in sixth grade. He promises me this time he's going to get his diploma, but now he's going to the bathroom, and I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> so Chris called me up a few months ago, and wanted to get his high school equivalency, finally, all right? So when anybody calls, they usually call my number or they'll call into the library and the library will then call my cell phone and say, so-and-so would like to talk to you. I call them up. I, as a program director, take their basic information. They could do it at the library, but it's usually me. It's easier to run it through me. I just take their name, I get their age, make sure they're 19 or older. 18 I'll work with, but they have to have been out of school for over a year or their graduating class has to have graduated or else they can get their little behind back in school and come to us later, okay? Um, so I get that information, kind of what their goals are. Some people call because they want ESL. Some people call because they want their high school diploma. Somebody might need just to improve their basic skills. We've had a couple of people over the years I've been there to call up and they'll say, in order for me to better my job at a local grocery store or something, I have to show that I have a 10th grade reading level or I have to get my math up to a 9th grade reading level. And that's what their goal is, and that's what we work on, and that's as long as we have them. So I get that basic information. I then take all this information and call the proper library, say Chris was in Hamilton, so guess what? I call myself and say, here's your client. <laughs> but you call the local coordinator and you say, here's the person that I have, and here's their information, here's their phone number, and then the local coordinator calls them up, makes an appointment with them to come in to talk. And the local coordinator, and that's my LC there, means the local coordinator. The local coordinator sets the meeting for an intake um, of the application. They also give them the TAVE test. That's how we test and find, the, find what level they're at. It's the test of adult basic education. 
and we give only the reading and the math sections. We don't do any of the other sections because we just want to find out their basic reading level and their basic math level. And we get people who come in and some people are in a ninth grade level and things and some people are in a second grade level for things. And sometimes there's a big discrepancy in the reading and math. Either one. So but that gives us and the local coordinator and myself, um, you know, take that tape. We also ask for a writing sample and it could just be a paragraph. We just basically want to see, do they know how to form a sentence? Can they, you know, how's their spelling? Is it readable? Can you read their handwriting? That kind of stuff. We're not looking for great literature here. Um, the local coordinator meets two or three times, and again, I saw this on Jennifer's as well, this took us a little while, just to check the person's commitment level because we would get somebody, they would come in, they'd be all ready to go, and we'd pair them up with a tutor, and then the tutor is in the library waiting in the radio shop. And, the next time. and so we don't do that anymore. You have to meet with a local coordinator three times. The tape testing usually is about two sessions anyway, because they're a couple hours, and most people can't attain, you know, they might do the, the reading one time and then come in and do the math another time. And, um, and then another time they will go over maybe the reading sample. So they will just talk through some goals, all right? Then the local coordinator contacts a tutor because they look at that person's availability. Well, they can only meet in the afternoon X number of days a week. Well, I have Mary over here. I think this person at this skill set level on these days would make a match. So the local coordinator calls the tutor, Mary, and says, I think I have a client for you. Um, and then they go over the, you know, who this person is. If it's a yes, then there's the local coordinator, the tutor, and the client all meet initially. Usually the local coordinator, I should back up, will meet with the um, tutor first and show here's the books, here's this reading level they're at, here's the math level they're at, and these are the books that you should start with. Okay? So then you have that introductory three people meeting, the tutor and client set up how they're going to communicate, which is very, very important. Are you going to call? Are you going to text? Are you going to email? What works for both of you so that you're not wasting somebody's time um, in saying you're going to be at a meeting when you're not really at a meeting? Because a lot of times you will find out there are a lot of things that your client is going to need besides education. They need to learn how to be on time. They need to learn how to respect people's time. They need how to to budget their time. They need to know that when the doctor says, can you meet Thursday at 3, to say, well, I have a tutoring session, then could we make it another time? Most of them will write down, okay, Thursday at 3. Forget all about the tutoring they have. Forget to call anybody, because in their mind, the doctor is the one who tells you what to do and when to do it. So it's those kind of things that you work through. Um, but um, that's why we let them know that communication is very important, because the tutors are doing this. They're, change their whole day around so that they can tutor you, you need to be respectful of that. And so the local coordinator keeps in touch with the tutor to support them and to make sure the resources are the proper resources. Sometimes certain books just won't work for certain people, either for the tutor themselves or for the student, you know, the client. Um, so then we readjust. We do have closet full of books in all libraries. We have resources in all libraries. And again, that's been a growing process. We didn't start with all that. We would do a lot of borrowing, you know, uh, some, one of the coordinators would say, I need Math Sense 3 for this thing, and, you know, it would be an email, and then Donna McKetty and Chenango would say, I have an extra one of those, and you put it in the inner office mail, and that's how things worked. Um, all organizational resources. Let's see, what am I talking about here? I named it something, now i got to remember. Okay, we have the applications. We have a volunteer application and a client application. I send out monthly a monthly Google Doc form, that's what I call it, because that's what it says up top, and that's for attendance and hours, and that's just, I think, an Excel, it's going to go into an Excel spreadsheet. Again, I tell you, I'm not an IT person, but I think that's what it does. So I send out, like, the end of the first week or so in April, I send out one for March. So I just go onto my computer, put in all the dates and everything, rename it a March um, monthly training or March monthly hour, tutor hours, and it goes into all the tutor's mailboxes. They put their client's name, they put their name, they put their prep hours, they put their contact hours, and then they hit the days, because the days are important for RSVP, the dates, I should say, that they met, they hit submit, 
I mean, once you've done it, it takes maybe one minute. There is a little note section. Some people like to write me notes. Some people don't put any notes in there. Uh, some of the notes might just say, um, you know, did me twice this week, so-and-so is sick, or we just got through level such-and-such such in a book. Those are just the kind of notes that somebody might put down in there. Okay, they send that, they hit submit, it all populates into a sheet for me, and I have the attendance for the whole county in there, which I use then just for my grants to show who's coming, who's going. Um, let's see, I said all that. Again, grants. Uh, most of the grants that we use are local grants, okay? The McNeese Foundation is just a, a local group in Hamilton that supports literacy, and they have given us a grant every single year, even before I came. Some the grant I just mailed in is for $1,400. I think I've asked them for 6000 in the past. Um, I know right now that there are a lot of nonprofits looking for money, so I try to not be greedy. Um, I could ask for the moon, but you know, I try to be really cognizant of that. Um, at this time, the focus of the grant I had for ESL because we need some new ESL <coughs> resources, and you know, the need is a little bit greater right now. So that's what I honed in on there. The Garmin Foundation again is a local um, grant source. Uh, the Central New York Community Foundation, obviously you know, is a little wider spread. We get money from the local rotary programs. The Hamilton Club uh, gives us, it says $400, but $400 helps. You know, you write these little grants. I have the dates all in my book for, you know, they're due on July 15th, the Hamilton Club. So, you know, I know in June, I'll put a little note at the beginning of June, write that grant for the Hamilton Club, the Lions Club, <coughs> community chest, colleges, uh, the Canocioni, which is a, an organization at Colgate, you know, they've given $1,000 in the past. $1,000 goes a long way. Um, you know, our resources that are consumable resources, we don't consume them, okay? We copy them, okay? Yeah, so sue me. All right, um, <laughs> I, uh, you gotta catch me first. <laughs> um, I usually seek the funding, pretty much. I mean, some of the, uh, of the, we have the Madison, the, Literacy Coalition of Madison County, which is newly formed. We've been there way before the coalition was, but now that the coalition is there, um, you know, they do help with some funding as well. But, and I hope the coalition stays around forever, but if the coalition goes away, we'll still be here. Because it's just, you know, it's a program that works on little funding sources and we just make it work. Some of the resources that we use are, we still use the GED books. You know, people thought when GED was over that, um, you know, and it's now the task, I tell people, math is math and reading is reading. And all that stuff that's in there, for the most part, is still good. There's no reason to throw out all of those books. Now, you're going to have to supplement some with the math because they've taken it now to functions and things that I don't even know how to do. Um, and But there's other books for that. But don't throw away old materials. If you have old materials, save them. They're good, you know. And people come in and they have a second and third grade level. You know, the basic reading in the GED series is is wonderful. Uh, with the task series, I just put our thoughts because I didn't really want it on paper, but we don't like them. <laughs> don't really like them at all. They're just they're more like a they're intimidating to people. I think they're very intimidating. Now there are certain people that come to us and they are. Um, they're tutors and they're, old, they're ex college professors and they like that level, but we only give the ex college professors for the most part. And I know I'm being a little stereotypical, but for us it's work. We only give them people at the higher end of the scale because they really have trouble, a lot of them, especially you know, teaching to people who you know, need it really spelled out for them. So uh, they like that. They also like that big Kaplan book that's like, you know, I can't even carry because it's so heavy. I would never give that to a client. I would look at that book and I would run out the door if I were the client. Sometimes just pages are intimidating. I'm a special ed director and a special ed teacher. You know how you present things to people makes a huge difference. It can be the same material, but if you give it to them over three months, instead of plump, here's your book, you know, you're doing okay. All right, so let's see. Again, start small, all right? It started small, started in one library. And now it has grown to 12, um, but it is all doable with a little pots of money and just people, a few people behind you 
you know, so you start with one or two people and, and again, you just love it. It's one of the best things you're going to do all day for yourself, for your tutor and the clients. Some people are lifelong friends. You know, they still, I mean, this one guy, the other, the one tutor that I had at uh, um, April 12th, one of the other tutors said she and the guy that she's been tutoring for a while, um, he gave her a ride to the airport the other day. I mean, it's like they're family now. So uh, it, it's just wonderful. It's not always like that, but it's, you know, there are connections like that. It's a wonderful program, and I look forward to talking to people at our little small table discussion. Okay, I'm done. Thanks. Thank you. And you know what? Those tutors are so lucky to get Tara's baked goods. Yeah. <laughs> we always love it when there's a program in our library and she brings us extras. She's fabulous. <laughs> well, thank you. And I know you've been sitting for a while. Um, our, the main reason I'm here is that in our community, we were having trouble getting students. We had all the tutors, but we had trouble getting students. No one really felt comfortable coming forth to admit that they had an issue. Uh, so we had a little different way of getting it. So let me just arrow forward here. So that's me <laughs> in our library. Uh, my undergraduate degree is in elementary education. So again, education is, is really important to me and always has been. We just changed our mission statement our mission statement before was the kids will be a public library. We'll provide books and other materials <laughs> for people reading. Da, da, da. Well, we really thought, well, that doesn't reflect what we're doing. And we just changed it. It has changed mm -hmm. the way we mm -hmm. do things. It's it really changed our lives. Um, every committee in our, our library board now uses this mission statement. When, and it's at the top of their agenda. And what are we doing that reflects back to this? So uh, I should also say I've been at my library 38 years. So I've seen it all. <laughs> and this, to me, makes more sense than anything we've done in, the, in all the years. Um, so I, I'm proud of that. And I just had my evaluation from the board. So much fun <laughs> and yeah. actually it was fun because they asked what what is that what was I most proud of for the year and this was one of them and it wasn't I didn't think of it the board came up with it and the staff came up with it so I really am proud of that now I was almost too embarrassed to put up these facts because when I started it was two people part-time with a thirty thousand dollar budget so I've been in a small library situation. I know small library situation. And I'd say in the last 10 years, or maybe even five years, things have really taken off for us. So uh, when we started our program in the food pantry uh, 10 years ago, 2007, our budget was maybe 300,000, maybe 350, and maybe eight staff people. So this looks really good. And, when people ask me if I'm going to retire, I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> we finally got to a point where I can do things. I can't leave them now. Uh, so just so you have a sense of, of where we are. So around 2007, remember ALA, so you have been there, started the Every Child Ready to Read. Well, because my education background, it really inspired me, and I wanted to do a big program. And I really worked hard on it. And we had all sorts of programs at the library that we sponsored. Nobody came. <laughs> Zero. And so I approached Cas Cares. Cas Cares is our local food pantry. The director, Gigi uh, Redmond, was president of our board at one time. So we had this relationship again, small town. And I said, Gigi, can you help me get people come to this really great program on early literacy. It's going to change their life. Sure, sure. So she recommended people who came into food pantry, they got everything ready. Zero came. So, okay. And this is not your normal food pantry. They are a class act food pantry. Um, they do more than hand out food. They provide support services. 
They have um, food or fresh foods that it's a special uh, fundraiser so people can have uh, fresh foods coming in. And obviously they work with us. So at that time they were moving to a bigger building and one of the board members said, Betsy, we could have a room at Cascades. Do you have any idea what we could do with it? Yes, I do. <laughs> and uh, we created the story room. And again, it started small. That's what we, the Arca reminded me to tell you that. Started very small with one literacy coordinator, Cindy sitting on the floor there. Um, the idea was to model to the parents that came in how to read, talk, sing, play with their children. Of course, then they had those stupid phonemic awareness and all these other things. But, um, so, and the idea was that the parents would stay. Like, you know what? If you're a parent of a young child and you have a really desperate situation, you're in a food pantry, need a break, <laughs> you know. So the, there's a big window there that came with the room. So the parents can watch what's going on, but they can continue shopping in the food pantry and have two minutes peace. And then Cindy is, is just a completely lovely person, completely non-judgmental, and they created all these wonderful relationships. And that's when we started getting, I just have to, I was going to take this slide out, but I love, we stack literacy in our food pantry. I love that. Uh, and then I had to have cute children. <laughs> and one of the, all my research shows the most important thing are more books in the home. So when, when the children are leaving, they always get a couple of books. They're always donations, either to um, the food pantry or to the library, and we provide them. Uh, I think that number is low. They try to keep stats, but I thought it was a lot more than that. So the idea is when you're getting, choosing the book for the person, that's when you do your spiel about detoxing play with the parent. And uh, we have a small grant from Core Credit Union. Credit unions and banks, those are great places for grants. You probably already know that. But um, this book, the favorite book program was amazing. It was 20 books for 20 families. And the families had to apply if they wanted to be part of it. And then we had a wonderful time choosing, well, what book has to be in there? And that's sort of cultural literacy, too. If you start kindergarten and you don't know what corduroy is, you already feel stupid. So we wanted to make sure that we had all the, the books that you know we think are classics. And uh, we got a little bin for them, and the kid, the family's got 20 classics in this little plastic bin, and then they have to write, what, what do you do with your books? What do you think about your books? Blah, blah, blah. And one little boy wrote, um, it's the first brand new thing I've ever done. I think books are going to be important to that kid. <laughs> And have you all heard of David Lankies at all? Yeah. Oh, I love David Lankies. If you have a chance, he is, he literally goes around the world and talks about the future of libraries and what we should be doing. And he wrote the Atlas of New Librarianship that won some award. Don't read it. <laughs> <laughs> I love I noticed you were writing that. I, it's very dry and, and Anyway, but he, he likes the idea of the social aspects of libraries. He's written a follow-up that I can't Expect remember more. the name. Expect more. And then actually there's one after that that had practical things in it. Uh, I spoke to his class because SU students often come to our library because we're so close to do programs and this and that. And so I did that. And the minute I told him the story about the little boy who said this, the, the first brand new thing I've ever had, he was like, oh, that's perfect. And he says, literally, Betsy, people all over the world have heard that story in Amsterdam and this and that. So anyway, that was a cool little program we did. We're applying again this year. Uh, and now Park Imagination Library, you all know about that. And I, I'm a little um, hesitant to say this, but we have a donor who just wrote a check for $30,000 for us for Dolly Parton. Yeah. 
<laughs> we were in kindergarten together. <laughs> so you never know. She moved out of the area in 1970, and I helped her mother get books. It's a long story. But anyway, I was going to take this one out too, but our whole idea at Taz Cares at the food pantry is to build the family, strengthen the family. That's what we, those kids need more than anything. They need that family. So Kazumi College is a small college. They have a photography club, and this is apparently something that's all over the country, is the family photo project. So the students come and take family portraits, and the people sign up and get dressed up, and it's usually around Christmas. And then, you know, a lot of people have a lot of pictures on their phone, but not many people can afford to get those printed. So the family um, portrait project, photo project, they get a portrait of their family and a little cheap old friend. And that, just that little thing strengthens families. And that's why, um, and again, doesn't cost us anything. We just coordinate it. And the kids, college kids really get a good, uh, lesson on how other people do mm -hmm. that may be in on that note. Mm -hmm. um, we went where people are, where the families are. So when we're talking about education, we're going where they are and where are they? All of us. Where are all of us? <laughs> right here. So these two tools, and actually I have another handout. Okay, that I forgot to send you. Um, text for baby. So new mothers, we say, you know, you know about this thing, text for babies? And um, Carla, one of our literacy coordinators who do the adult program, also does the, the um, food pantry, said, well, I'm not going to suggest anything I haven't tried. So she signed up. Her children are out of school now, out of college now. But she signed up and said she was three months pregnant <coughs> and tried it out for a few months. And uh, she said, hey, this is pretty good. When that Zika virus came out, she got a text message about it. And it's very short, you know, how to read thoughts and play with your, your kids, only short and interactive. So we suggest that to our young parents. And the other one is Vroom for a little, uh, little older kids, daily Vroom. So now I get to try it out. So I said my little son, Davey, who's really my husband, was you know, four years old, and they asked for a picture. <laughs> and it took like four screens, and finally at the bottom it says, no picture, thank you. Oh, good. <laughs> and that's really a great resource, too. So again, you're going where people are to try to help them become better parents, because the whole premise of every child ready to read was to help our parents, caregivers, grandparents, <laughs> learn that their daily interaction with their children are what's going to prepare them for kindergarten, not once a week story time. I uh, went to the very first workshop I'm in a room like this with three times as many people, and the woman said, so you think your story times are really helping the kids get ready for kindergarten? And we're all smiling and happy. She says, no, <laughs> not at all. It's every day. So the whole room kind of went, <laughs> so now this is what we do. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to talk too much about the early um, literature. You know I can talk for a long time about it. And that period is what, just two days a week, right? Three. Three. Three days a week. So it's not an every day. Yeah, so it's three hours, three days a week. Um, so what happened were these relationships, this totally non-judgmental interactions with the families that come to uh, Cas cares, and that's when people would admit, I didn't finish high school, I dropped out, whatever. And all of a sudden, now we get more students than tutors. And uh, we started adding uh, English as a second language. And uh, as Tara said, there's so much more um, consultation. You know, do, do you really need such and such? So our Literacy coordinators have really learned social services, that 211 type thing. Um, and then we always figure out, we partner with the schools, the a Rotary Club, same thing. Rotary's big on literacy. And then, of course, the small grants everywhere we can. 
So we had early literacy, that was, oh, I was so happy. And then that ended up adult literacy, which, oh, great. And uh, Tara already talked about all this, but I had to include the picture of Big Mike and Little Mike. <laughs> uh, Big Mike <laughs> finally admitted that he had to finish school, and it's so old, he's got his GED. But he's holding his books, and Little Mike's right next to him. And uh, some of the tutoring happens in our libraries. And actually, I keep approaching our board saying, we need a bigger library for tutoring space. Because <laughs> you want it private, but not too private. You know, we have one man who's been being tutored for a long time and happened to go by the office that we kind of turned into a tutoring space. And he was sounding out letters. He's like a 40-year-old man. He does not want to be on the, the main part of the library doing yeah. that. Um, so uh, anyway, I just love that picture. I to include it. This is the one, if nothing convinces you, this should convince you. This uh, slide right here. And it's from the Heritage Foundation. So it's you know uh, quite a conservative you know organization. It's not some you know you know huggy lovey type thing. This is the dollars and cents we're talking about. And this is from 2010, I think. Yeah, so it's a few years old. 2013. Um, so no high school diploma, benefits received, $46,582. Taxes paid, 11000 So your deficit is 35000 Someone who doesn't have a high school diploma are using social services and are not putting into the system. High school graduate, oh, better, you know, it's almost twenty thousand dollars less. Some college, you're at six thousand. College graduate, bingo, they're putting in the system thirty thousand. They're not taking out thirty-five thousand. They're putting in thirty thousand. If you ever have to talk to a group asking for funding, this. You know, maybe there's an updated one. I didn't have time to check. But this is your, you know, dollars and cents. Why are we doing adult literacy? Why are we helping people graduate from high school? It helps all of the society. It lifts us all up. That was my speech. <laughs> I get a little passionate about that. Um, so as we talked, we celebrate everything. The people that are coming to a food pantry don't have much to celebrate. So they, Cindy is a big party girl. And uh, Carla, Cindy and Carla, Cindy has since retired. But she was the one, I think, maybe I'm wrong here, that came up with let's have a graduation and just put out an email. Anybody got a cap and gown? Everyone was so glad to get rid of that cap and gown. <laughs> um, and this is just more people uh, celebrating. The guy and, and the, with the two women there, He's a retired postal worker. He's had his career. He's probably getting a really good retirement if he's a retired postal worker. But he left school right before graduation. And he saw an article in the paper about somebody getting their GED. And he came in to me and said, that's it. I really would like to do that. I said, what? I couldn't believe he didn't graduate from high school. He got in trouble right before graduation and then graduated. Well, like, you know, three weeks he was ready to take the exam. But he came to the graduation, he wore that cap and gown, his sister and his wife were there, and it, it pleased him. He's probably 70-something. Uh, Gary in the middle is um, retired, some business guy on Long Island. He was never a teacher. He is now. He's had many, many students. And I love the way every student gets a rose. Do you see the little guy in the bottom? His rose is now a sword. <laughs> And that John, and that, again, another picture. This guy was so happy to get his, his degree. And as Jen said, it's the most gratifying thing you will ever have in your career. I love recommending a good mystery. I love that. But helping somebody get a job? Mm -hmm. um, so we, end, we have a lot of migrant tutors around us. We have a lot of farms. Mm -hmm. so And they've been coming to. Um, Cas Cares, and they, they, Cindy and Carla worked with our church to get transportation for them, so uh, they could come up and be tutored at Cas Cares while their children were uh, being entertained. 
And then we said, what the heck? <laughs> Again, this is over the years. And Cindy and Carla, and now it's Molly and Carla, said, yeah, in the summer, we have a lot more kids hanging around than school-age kids. And you all know about summer slide. That's why we do part of this. So uh, the friends paid for a high school student to come and kind of duplicate whatever we're doing. We don't even call it summer reading anymore. It's summer learning program. Mm -hmm. To duplicate that up one morning a week at uh, the food pantry. And I didn't mention before, that mural was done by the Kansas College art class. You know, everything we do, I said anything that's nice is either a grant to the friends of the library or donated. <laughs> um, so you see, I don't remember a couple of years ago when it was dig digging the reading or whatever mm -hmm. it was. So we got those minor caps thing. I oh, want not saying it right. The flashlight goes out of the end. We don't even give incentives in our library anymore, but mm -hmm. incentives work really well in Cavs Cares. So that whole family, each of them got one because one brother didn't want the other brother to have one. <laughs> so there's a little competition there. And the little girl in the bottom there that's reading, she had completed whatever you know it was. And Carla said, oh, so and so, I'd love to take your picture for the paper. She goes, That'd be a great idea, but you know what? I think I should be in front of the mural for the picture. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she, uh, she has a career ahead of us. Uh, and then last year we got a grant for, again, strengthening family, family read aloud. So we got 20 copies of Charlotte's Web. And every week, whoever was volunteering at the food pantry would say, oh, what page are you on? Oh, I love that part try to keep it going. And then at the end of the summer, part of the grant was a big party. And that's the party. There's Marla. I didn't, she is a retired reading teacher that moved into town and said, is there anything I can do to help you? And Cindy had just retired. It was like, bingo. And she's been the best. Uh, but I don't know, if you, many of you know the important book that, um, Rain does this, 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 but the important thing is that Rain does this. So she did that with this group. I think there were like 40, 50 people there in this big space at Cass Cares and asked them what's important about reading. And she wrote them all down. And this one woman said, when we're reading together, I don't think about anything else. So anyway, we're going to try again for this year because of when Dixie is going to be mm -hmm. this year. But we're, we're taking suggestions because at the end of the summer, they're given another small, you know, another chapter book to continue mm -hmm. the program. And don't forget to read. Don't forget to read. One little girl said, I like snuggling with my mother. Mm -hmm. you know, those things go on grant applications. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are. Um, the woman there in pink hugging her boy didn't have a high school degree. Ended up getting her high school degree, getting her LPN, and she's now working on her RN. Mm -hmm. So we, again, we didn't go out to do family literacy. That wasn't our, our goal. Our goal was just to do, you know, a little thing. But one thing led to the other. And our latest thing, our parenting workshops, we have done a grant. Uh, two professionals um, are meeting with people. Parenting is tough. And parenting is tough when you don't have money. And parenting is tough when your boyfriend's left or whatever. You know, it's a tough job. So I hit something there. OK. Um, hello. I think I did something so it won't advance. Well, it doesn't matter. But she, um, so they, they have eight or nine parents who are coming regularly who are, uh, you know, spilling their guts <laughs> about how hard it is. Oh, thanks. Uh, and one thing that Carla and Marilyn do that I probably never thought of, they get <coughs> tablecloths, they cut flowers and put it in the center. They get, it's respect. 
we respect our families, we respect the people that we work with. And the professionals that came there <coughs> said, you know what? Um, we all have trouble parenting. No one has an easy time. And this is our challenge. This was my challenge with my kids. You know, do you have some challenges you want to share? So again, here's all the collaborators. That in our school district, there's another uh, library that's much smaller than us. It serves 800 people. And they are the site for a lot of the tutoring. And we work together. We're separate entities, but uh, we're, we're uh, together. Um, we have also started a, there's a food pantry that at St. James Church, Catholic Church, um, has 18 miles south of us in Georgetown, which literally has nothing. And uh, they have a small food pantry, and a retired first grade teacher goes there once a morning. Uh, and she does more of a preschool. They have the kids, the parents uh, are downstairs chatting, mm -hmm. and she goes through a whole routine and has kids for a couple hours. Um, things have not been as busy lately because their school, thank you, has started a preschool where the kids are getting bus to this. I don't even know how. My next thing is I want to get on buses. Because these poor little kids are on the bus for a long time. Um, so some private donations, you know, I could go on and on. But I guess my main thing is, someone asked me, how much does this take out of your time, of your day? Nothing. I, 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 I uh, talk to the literacy coordinators. How is it going? I learned more about the adult literacy today from Tara. I walk by the room while people are being tutored, and I know they come and go. Um, I don't know the people up at Cass Cares, but I know they work real hard at it. So we have two people that we pay to do Cass Cares and our literacy coordinators but they applied for grants. They just applied to a gr uh, for a grant for better furnishings because everything up at the story room are hand-me-downs. And, um, but they have time for that. They have time to really put things together. We meet, as I say, and I, maybe when I don't have anything to do and they happen to be there. <laughs> you know, nothing scheduled. Um, email's always good. Uh, what else can I tell you? So for me, the biggest amount of time I spend on our adult literacy and our family literacy is coming to talk to you all. <laughs> um, and I love writing about what other people do. So what we need, what we learn is you can't go in saying, we're going to do this, this, and this. You need to be led by the needs of the people that are there. Maybe your folks won't need what our folks need. You can start small, you can expand it, and then there's practicalities. They have the, the um, Marla and Carly have this kind of ritual they do with the kids, that they come in and they wash their hands. And again, it's the respectful thing, you know, it's like, like sanitizer. And at first I thought, oh, your tone is good, is it dirty? But it's now in the story. This is a special. Uh, I, I don't think I would have gone there, but they did, and they, it works for them. And the parents sign in, and they can't leave the building, but they can go shopping in the building. They can't leave the building. And uh, the volunteers at Cass Cares who sort the clothes and put the food on the shelves just started with cross training. So if they're not busy, they can come in. And if we're not busy, we can help them. Cast Cares and the library are two separate entities, but um, we're collaborators, and we should be doing more collaborator. We're collaborating. Um, there was something else I was going to tell you. That just, so, oh, uh, so Marley and uh, Carla coordinate their lot of volunteers who are at that story room those three mornings a week. There's never a child left alone with an adult. So there's always two adults. Um, and uh, the volunteers are some retired teachers. Some are just grandmas who miss their grandchildren and want to be around little guys. Uh, and they coordinate all that. My initial vision for this was that it was going to be all volunteer. Um, 
as you mentioned earlier, I, I was a medic at our ambulance corps. It was all volunteer. You came in, you signed in, you signed out. There was you know, no professional coordinator. The fire department's all volunteer. So I, you know, I thought, well, we could do this all volunteer. It's easier with a coordinator, but I think it can be done um, using you know, different record keeping things and training. So I think that's all I can Yeah. Excellent. So, thank you so much. So now we're going to open it up. So if anybody has questions for Jennifer or Betsy or Tara, please go ahead and ask away. I have a question for Jen. Um, and maybe you said this, just to be clear though, for your staff members, are they doing What's their setup? Are they doing the tutoring on library time or volunteer time? I, they were doing it on library time. Mm -hmm. Library was fine with giving them an hour mm -hmm. out of their week okay. to tutor somebody in the community that needed it. Mm -hmm. I, in the beginning, had more than one student, so I would do some on my own time, mm -hmm. just so I could learn about the whole process and kind of get a better feel for it. Okay. Um, both of you, emphasized not having high school students and I'm, I guess I've tutored high school students and I've tutored freshman college students who clearly hadn't gotten help in high school and I guess I'm wondering why the library would choose not to help high school students. What resources are they supposed to have? Well, to me, it's not that the library is it's just our program. Mm -hmm. but we, we, we can't spread ourselves too thin, mm -hmm. and you're not allowed to take, to be in a task or GED program if you um, are high school age or in your graduating class hasn't graduated or you haven't been out a year. So that's just the requirements for the program, and that's what we do. Mm -hmm. um, but there could be other resources in the library that may help somebody like that. So your program is only is specifically for the... Specifically to get your high school equivalency some basic skills for English as a second language. Okay. Mainly for me too, it's just taking it naturally. You're not going to have enough tutors. And the schools should be taken care of right. in the schools. Mm -hmm. They age out of the schools at some point and they have nothing. So it's to focus more on that. I mean, people might call and I might suggest, you know, check with the guidance counselor, check with this person, check with that, but we just can't be everything to everybody. And it wouldn't be manageable. Um, I have actually several questions, but I'll only ask one or two and give others a chance. Um, I think this one was for Jen. Um, you talked about that. Um, your, your guidelines along with that um, piggybacking off of what um, Alyssa was saying, or Allison, um, you determine whether someone is a non-reader, writer, or below high school level. Is that based on the same kind of pretest test that um, is? Yeah, we didn't use the same test that she did. Okay. We were using a very simplified method, mm -hmm. just starting and getting our feet wet. So we right. would, um, the training we had with the literacy professional put us in this Live Start book and it had tests. In okay, it. it's like a pretest. It's like it is a pretest. You kind of get a handle. Um, and see, because it would have you read, but then it would have you dictate spelling, mm -hmm. so you could see right away okay. if somebody they might be able to read right. high school level, they can't spell. So, um, uh, and you also talked about the fact that you, um, I believe, you said that you have tutoring sessions one hour a week. Was that your letter? Um, what's the uh, what kind of statistics do you have on the success rate? I mean, I, I you know I think about one hour a week out of the number of hours that somebody could possibly use in terms of increasing their literacy skills. How has the what has the success rate been? And I don't mean to put you on the spot. Um, I don't have actual numbers. So I'm not I'm not involved with that project anymore. Okay. I left left after. Um, in the beginning, we would just measure people's goals. Okay, did they achieve their goals? Yes. So we would consider, because oh, okay. I would go meet with them and we'd have them for their goals. I want to be able to pass the test. Or I want to be able to um, 
you know, chat with my daughter mm -hmm. or be able to write greeting cards. So we would just measure success based on when the, their goals were achieved. And then mm -hmm. towards the end, we were starting to get trained in um, different methodologies for before tracking and after tracking. Okay. Um, so that's and we continually, we definitely needed that more for like our ESL students right. because we, it's hard to judge if the teachers we hired were being successful. Um, and needed to show that. So we went, we started to train in like, is it best testing? Is that one of them? Yeah, best plus. Best, best plus. plus. We started doing best plus. Um, and now I don't know. Um, we use best plus, we don't any, anymore. It didn't really, for us, it wasn't worth the time and the effort to do it. So we're hooked up now, just beginning, um, with a company called Intercambio, I-N-T-E-R. C-A-M-B-I-O. They're out of Colorado and they do sell programming but they also, um, the April 12th workshop that we did, they did a webinar with us and uh, Carla, we had two of our coordinators happen to be ESL, have masters in ESL. We have very well qualified coordinators. Um, but so they had been researching to find out what else would be good to use for the ESL population. And in the getting, they got a few of the booklets and they talked to people. And so that's the angle that we're going with now. And um, we're really looking forward to plumping up our ESL resources and what we do using that company. And I should say, Carla's from Holland. So she yeah. is English yeah. as a second yeah. language. Yeah. <laughs> and she went back to get her master's when she started volunteering because she was so intrigued by the whole process. She just did it, you know. We had a presentation from someone at our local BOCES who runs the task training programs here. And the impression I had leaving that was essentially if somebody wants to start the process to do the task it's really very hard, and whatever literacy program you're going to do is not going to be enough. And that was, and and you're, and I hear you talking about it, you know, people taking the task as a result of your program. So I'm really curious, like how that. My program is like somewhat different. We didn't do math, right? We would only help with the essay, and some people do. I we did have students who passed everything but the essay. We had quite a few. Um, but you know, the test is a hard test. Yeah. So you need I to do the math. You can take yeah. a mm -hmm. whole prep class, it's not going to, it isn't going to be enough. Actually, in my current library, we're looking at like Career Online High School. Um, I don't know if you know about that. It's, it's an accredited online school, and you can get a diploma through it as an alternative. Because I have worked with many people over the years that have tried two or three times and just can't pass the test. It's really difficult. And, and you, you have an online thing we were trying out, right? Well, that's just a program that Gold coordinates with. That is called Aztec, and you have to buy into that. And again, we use grants. Um, and uh, Camp Soda Library, which wrote part of a grant or got money for a grant, we use part of our grant to use that for a year. But I want to go back to the task test. It's not as hard as everybody says it is. Don't let people scare you. Okay? It is not. We. A lot of people will come in to be tutors for us and they think it's only reading. No, we do all five subjects. We do all of them that are on the task test. Um, and, you know, we're not a huge program. But I think right now at, at our graduation, I think we have 12 or 13 people graduating this year. You take that and extrapolate that amount out for the thing that Betsy showed you on there money-wise, and that's a good push for your community, dollars and cents-wise. I don't care about dollar and cents. I care about the actual people that come in, but if you have to show that. But, you know, and I'm going to let you know a little secret here, and don't spread this around. <laughs> but there's a readiness test, and we have the readiness test. I don't know why they give it to us, um, but they, the state lets us have the readiness test. The readiness test is 20 to 22 questions in all five subjects that somebody takes to see if they're ready to pass the task. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the regents in New York State, but as a teacher, um, I used to hear from the high school, especially math teachers all the time, that when they go to, when the students all, let's say they take the regents in algebra, that test is sent into the state. The teachers have no idea what their students have to score. The state scores all the tests 
Then they set the bar because they want to see, sorry, how stupid they're going to look because of how difficult they made the darn test. And then they set the, the level. So it's really hard to teach. What level do you have to teach at to get somebody to pass the regents? Well, it's the same way in the task. So in these readiness test booklets, if you take, and I can tell you right now, I don't know if I could pass the task in math right now. Honestly, I was never in math school. I wasn't. But we don't let people know that when they're going in, <laughs> depending on who we're talking to. Because a lot of it is, a lot of people have a lot of common sense. And I can look at problems. I don't know how to do the math part of it. A lot of it is the vocabulary. If you teach people good math vocabulary, I'm trying to think of a problem I did. Because I get these readiness tests, and the first thing I do is I sit down and I take them. Because I was that smart or stupid I am. All right? And so there was a question on there. And I'm trying to think of the two. Oh, exponential. I don't know what the opposite of exponential would be. But there were two, four answers. Because there's multiple choice. There's four answers. And two of them were, if you did all this plotting and math, and there's all these charts and everything, yeah, are you going to show exponential growth or whatever that other word is? Well, I could tell just by looking at the chart, it was not shooting off the top. But if you don't know what exponential means, whether in a math sense or an English sense, but I would have a 50-50 chance, not a 25% chance, because I knew what exponential meant, I had a much better chance of getting that answer correct. So it's not all about, I couldn't teach a function to save my life, okay? But people that I tutor pass the test because they need to know basic math, they need to know some algebra, everybody should know their multiplication facts. I know I'm old, I don't care, <laughs> but if you don't know those multiplication right. facts and you're trying even to do simple algebra, you're not going to get there because you don't have the foundation. Now, if people can't grasp them, there's ways to teach those facts, those multiplication facts, I know I can go on. You stop me whenever you want to. But um, there's ways to teach those facts. It's not a hundred facts that people have to learn. You teach somebody the community property, and they don't even know need to know necessarily what that is. But if you know three times five, you know five times three. Okay, so now you have to learn fifty facts. Do you know that anything times zero is nothing? Okay, those facts are gone. Do you know that anything times one is itself? All those facts are gone. Most people know their doubles. If you know your doubles, even most of your doubles. You just take that 100 chart and go, see, you know that, see, you know that, see, you know, and then all of a sudden there's a handful of them they have to learn. So it's how you present. Most students, um, in my experience, give unrealistic expectations. So they'll go to a BOCES program, which is like a three-month thing. They might be at like sixth grade level. And so they go to the prep, but they really are like pre-pre-prep. They're not even ready for the prep course. So a lot of times that students just get so completely frustrated, but they're just not ready for the prep course. Um, so they need a, they need a, a different option. And, and my library, whenever we've tried to do like task classes, they've been incredibly unsuccessful. The drop off rate is just incredible. And there are some people who come to us that will not pass that test. I can tell it to you the first time I meet them. And I'm not trying to be, to talk down to anybody. But there are certain skills you just have to have. Yeah. I have a question for Jennifer. So, did you say that you were not serving non-English speakers in the program that you had? We, what we did when we first started was um, we had a small group class. We had classes for ESL. Separate classes. Separate classes. Oh, okay. So, and then we made the tutoring for those who could speak English well enough to talk to a tutor. Okay. So we wanted the. It was because of the volume. It was easier to have classes. ESL and then give them a tutor when they they, they pass out the classes. And was there a literacy volunteers organization in the area? Yes. <laughs> they have, they just never provide enough tutors. So this is an added sort of Right, but I mean we had people who were waiting two years to get a tutor. Right. Mm -hmm. um, plus it seemed that anybody needing basic literacy, like uh, a lot of times the native speakers get lost. And I felt like with our local agency, that was often the case. And they would say, oh, yeah, well, they're probably dyslexic and stuff. So it's like, well, yeah, but it's it doesn't mean you can't tutor them. <laughs> One minute, I'm going to watch that clock. But I'm the office that I am in, BOCES is there as well. And they do their BOCES adult literacy there. 
if they have, they, they want everybody to come in at ninth grade level. Well, yeah, so would I, but guess what, they don't. <laughs> and so if they come in there and they test out and they use that tape and it's not ninth grade level, they send them to us. We try to get them up to there, but we don't usually even pass them back a lot of times because we work with them and get them where they need to go. They don't have to know everything. You only have to get on those readiness tests that I was telling you about, that there's 20 questions, there's 22, two of them don't count because they're testing things. But you in some of you can you can pass eight questions and still pass that part of the test. You don't have to get 90%. <laughs> You have to get like you got on the regions. So, so and Carla said so many of your folks 